Um, so, Azu, welcome to this first conversation for Open Ended, which is a new platform for activism and design which we've been speaking about now for a few months. The goal is to bring together some of the world's leading thinkers and creators in the space of design and creativity with a vision to understanding your work, your thinking, and to really unpack mechanics of how you work across disciplines. Uh, and equally, of course, to looking to your own dreams for the future and how they're manifesting in this moment. So we're going to be creating a manifesto of these ideas over the course of these conversations. And in the coming weeks, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be bringing together participants like yourself in groups to talk through your ideas, to connect, to share, and to build upon some of the plans, projects, and ideas that you raise in these conversations. So Azu, to say a little bit about yourself, we were last together in Cape Town probably at, during the last week of the old world, as we know it, I think. And we were both judges on the Social Impact Arts Prize in South Africa. And we had this amazing moment in time to actually watch, I suppose, a little bit from the outside, the changes that were taking place in the world, to listen and maybe to reflect a bit on what may have been coming. Uh, but equally, we realized that we share a lot of the same uh, experiences, we talked a lot about identity, we talked a lot about our vision for a different kind of future. And that is one of the reasons this entire project has come about. So, thank you. And to say very you. briefly, go ahead. No, oh, thank, thank you. It's um, remarkable that you've been able to encapsulate the transition in, in, uh, in a really beautiful way. It's, um, it's a remarkable moment in history right now. So um, um, I think the activities that we engage in at this particular moment have the potential to create um, massive shifts in the way we imagine the future. Um, yeah, it's actually quite very moving to think about that in this moment, um, especially given that we're now on completely separate continents. So I will give a brief bio on you because you're, there's so much to say and equally this will be on the open-ended newsletter and also the open-ended Instagram if people want to read more about you, although many people will already know who you are and of your work. So Azu started off his career as a scientist. He did his master's in public health from Cambridge and he was also a journalist and a curator. And he, in 2010, founded the Lagos Photo Festival and uh, that was, I suppose, the beginning of his work in culture. And he hasn't looked back at all since then. So I'd like to start the conversation, Azu, by asking you about your work uh, leading up to the founding of the Lagos Photo Festival. What took you there? Uh, and just to give a little bit of insight into a journey that you took that really completely transcended boundaries. Thank you. It's great. Um... Before Lagos Photo Festival, we actually, uh, I founded the African Artists Foundation, and that happened in 2007. I moved back to Lagos in 2006, and a few months later, um, I just thought it was essential to to get artists to work together, to build a community, and and um, I thought it was something that was lacking. There were a few galleries doing quite well. But in terms of like a, a community of artists with the potential of bringing people into a culture safe space, um, I thought I could create something in that regard. Um, it was three years after that that we created the Lagos Photo Festival. And Lagos Photo Festival was just an easy option, something um, that really picked itself because photography has a, an incredible immediacy about it and urgency about it that allows you to create intervention immediately. And um, for the longest time, and even now, Africa remains really obscure and really remains exoticized or romanticized or, or almost an abstraction. But photography, through photography, we're able to create tangible connections. And I believe photography is the reason for the explosion and of course, social media of um, a lot of artists from Africa and the diaspora um, on the global stage because we're able to share on these platforms. So 
it was essential that uh, we push back against dominant narratives that really keeps um, Africa down in this sort of like the, with the disease, the deprivation, the, the displacement, the famine, and all the terrible situations that everyone is very well aware of. And um, we wanted to create a narrative that was more nuanced. And when you create new ones, then you can create the opportunity for intervention um, and also to empower the creatives on the continent who are actually making great work. And again, comes back to the thing that I like the most, community. Um, I thought it was essential to create a platform that can bring a community of people that embrace what I call the African sensibility together. So it's not, it wasn't about um, supporting or promoting or giving an opportunity to artists from Africa and the diaspora, but it was about bringing people that have this, embraced this sensibility together. So a lot of the artists that we've shown, our photographers we've shown have been from all over the globe, even from the first edition, you know. But the work that they make um, is unique because they make it with conviction, with a sensibility, with a sensitivity, and uh, an attention that really wasn't celebrated. And so, yeah, I can be, I think it was a really important moment. And I think um, Lagos Photo was able to achieve a lot over the last, I've been able to achieve a lot over the last uh, 10 years. I mean, that's an understatement. So what, I mean, one of the things that I think is very remarkable about you is your positivity, both in your language and your approach. You talk about decolonization. You talk about, you basically took the power of the image uh, and you allowed for this festival to show individuals owning it, whatever their relationship to Africa was, and to turn the lens back onto the continent. I also think that you're very unapologetic for the definitions that you use. So it's Pan-African and equally, you don't apologize for the fact that we do have these shadows hanging over colonized or previously colonized countries, this idea that there will always be an other and an outsider. So I'm very curious about really, as you set up the festival, what was the vision for it? I know you've spoken in the past about photography as activism, uh, and you were empowering these photographers to have their own voice, but the, kind of the beginning of that journey and how it manifested, uh, both getting people from across the continent together to participate, but equally allowing audiences to understand what you were trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I think I still remember very, very clearly when I started and I thought this is going to be incredible. This is going to be great. It's going to be powerful. And everyone thought I was really crazy because, you know, I spoke to Red Coolhouse, I spoke to Vivian Sasson, I spoke to some of the leading names in in industry. And um, but I, I, I targeted the people I knew cared. And then there's nothing that beats passion. I mean, these guys are people who at the top of their food of the food chain, at the top of their game, they're able to they're recognized as uh, leading industry practitioners. But um they have a passion for the situation. And you know, when you get these people in the room or you have a conversation with them, it gives you a lot of encouragement because um we the tendency is to believe that we're alone and that, you know we're like no one really gets the importance of what we're doing. No one really gets the um the creativity and the energy that it takes to do what we do but that's really a lie if we have the generosity to share and the confidence to share to create a situation where we can all meet then we can find a lot of we can build a community and that's what i found when i made the first step towards you know um creating the festival and people were very generous with their time with the ideas with their contacts and we were able to bring in a whole bunch of artists to Lagos. And that's something else that I found to be important. Um, not only is it important to share these ideas, but it's also important to host. And hosting is a really powerful thing. You know the importance of people mm -hmm. bread with you, coming to your home, sharing a meal with you, you know, celebrating with you, hanging out with you. And this is something that is unusual. It, it wasn't, it never happened in Lagos, for example. Um, in recent time, maybe Fest X77, we had a major festival. Um, but having a whole art community looking onto this, you know, place that is seen to be dangerous and obscure and, you know, was unusual at the time. And um, as I say, you know, success builds success, getting everyone together, the workshops, the talks, the community, 
all of that stuff really made a huge impact and still inspires me. I still look back at that period to get a sense of encouragement of the four things that I want to do in the future. And was there a connection between the African Artists Foundation and the festival? Or what, did you keep them as completely separate entities? Oh, really good question. I, I, I thought for the sake of identity that it needed its own, you know, logo, its own image, its own... And I, I had to find a way to remove and detach my um, personality from it to allow it to really thrive. Um, but it was a production of the African Artists Foundation, but I don't think a lot of people really knew this at the start. It wasn't really... Um, it was a program designed and created by the African Artists Foundation, but it wasn't that obvious because um, AEF African Artists Foundation was famous for organizing the national art competition, organizing local exhibitions and doing workshops and residencies, but mostly individual arts like painting, sculpture, the traditional fine art forms. But photography was something that we hadn't done in this very dedicated fashion. So um, yeah, it was a production of the African Artists Foundation, but we did as much as possible to give it a sort of unique um, public voice, separate I guess. I see. Okay. And then in terms of the festival as it stands now, or like the last iteration, could you explain a little bit about what it is? Because I know there's the actual exhibition, but there's so much more associated with it. So you talked about community. If for me, it's just this really powerful example of how you can bring culture, but it becomes this force for bringing not only people together, but empowering people to have a different kind of voice. And so it's obviously evolved. And I know it's been different every year, but maybe if you could explain a little bit about what the experience is if you were to visit. So um, we've always had a very conscious thematic approach. And so the, um, the first four or five years of the festival, we really had this sort of inferiority complex, if you like, as an institution, because we were new, we were, we wanted people to, we were, we were a little bit defensive, we were trying to show that Africa, we didn't want to replace the, what we call the Afro-pessimism, the, the, the idea that Africa is a sort of dark, hopeless situation. We didn't want to replace that with another cliche, we thought to replace it or to challenge it with work, you know, that was uh, made with um, conviction and care and sensibility and sensitivity. But um, we did that for maybe three, four, five years, but we quickly thought we can do more with this agency. We shouldn't worry too much about the way the rest of the world sees us now. I think we have done a lot in empowering other creatives to be able to tell our own stories in our own way and not worry too much about the perception of outsiders towards us. But I thought it was now important for us to take that agency and to design our own future. So I think it was in 2015, we had the theme, Designing Futures. And mm -hmm. that really became the moment where we crystallized the festival to give a bit more urgency and agency to artists and creatives to be able to do a bit more with it. Um, last year, the theme was Passports. And we've always felt like our themes are almost like, um, have a sort of prescience to it, a kind of predictability or prognosis, if you like, about impending situations. So we wanted to challenge the notion of image and identity as represented on a passport and what that means and how that creates inequality. And I think we can all see what the what that situation means today and how your passport and you gives you privileges and options and how your identity is reduced to a um, an image that is readable on a piece of paper. And so it's so incredibly um, ironic when you think about the original idea of what a password was meant to do. Um, so we, we've always found a way to workshop ideas, get designers, not just photographers, artists, um, writers, thinkers. We have, we've had like really great, and then, you know, we talk about Pan-Africanism. How do you create the situation for Pan-Africanism? Um, if you don't actually create this situation where we can bring people together. So it's always great with the festival. We have artists from Ghana, Togo, South Africa, or in Lagos at the same time, dialoguing and sharing ideas. Last year we had Ibrahim Mahama over. We had a whole bunch of artists from Ghana, from um, South Africa who came by. And it was, we have the seminars, the workshops, the conferences, all is well attended by the public. Um, public presentations, outdoor exhibitions, 
you know, displays in public spaces. Um, also try to bring a democratic approach to art, to art engagement because, you know, in countries like Nigeria, and, um, there's an, an elitism that is associated with art. It's about your, you know, how your privilege, if you like. Um, so with Lagos Photo from the from start, we were conscious about creating the opportunity for the public to engage with art and the messaging and the ideas that these incredible artists were coming up with. So, I mean, I think that part of exactly this is this process that, you know, you obviously were consciously moving towards this was the idea of culture being inaccessible. And the truth is, I'm sitting right now in Islamabad, and so I think about that a lot. But equally, it's very hard for somebody to walk through the doors of the National Gallery in London uh, or the Royal Academy if they feel that they don't belong. And I think that that you know, the way you've been able to structure something which has been world-class leading, driving intellectual thought and dialogue, but equally feels expansive enough for anyone to walk through the door, has been, you know, of course, representative to, you know, countries around the world from a creative space, but equally has been driving to the future. And I, I really love the way you described it as prescient because I, I completely think it is. I know, I think it was 2017 where your theme was post-truth. Um, was that so so this was the, the next thing I really wanted to get to is like really these themes and the ones that have felt most powerful to you. You talked about one already, but how you've been maybe surprised by how people have responded. Have any of them been difficult or controversial or caused you problems? Uh, and I know it's not just about photography, there's also photojournalism, there's a moving image. So how have you been able to not only get people behind these scenes, but equally, what is the next step? What is the outcome afterwards? Do you let it go or do people come back to you with, um, I don't know, new ideas or interventions or maybe criticisms? That's a really great question. Um, I think your previous question really helps answer that question because um, if Lagos Photo was this festival or Biennale or Triennale or whatever it was in isolation, that happens, you know, every two years or every year in October and that's it then we'd, I, I wouldn't really be excited to do it. But when we create that situation um, in October for three months, we are quickly able to engage with the community again through the African Artists Foundation and through all of the activities that we do. Some of the most incredible things that really leave me speechless is the ability to impact younger artists, younger photographers, younger thinkers, to make new work, to think about art in a different way. And we also set up the portfolio review, sometimes sponsored by various industry um, champions. Um, so we have a review of the portfolios and then we um, we um, give a prize, sometimes a cash prize or mentorship or an exhibition, depends on what we get. And we hand it out to the community and it's, it's really transformative. But coming back to the idea of the themes, you know, we, just put our ears to the ground. The artists are the ones who are mostly in tune with what's going on in society. And then we just sort of give it language, articulate it. It's like when you read the work of a, a, a great writer like Tolstoy, who just describes what you're thinking, but you haven't quite given it voice. So, you know, just put the words together to create that thought process into words. It's what the curators try to do. When we cur curate the festival, the work is out there. The situation is out there. It's about articulating it and coming up with the, the, the narrative that ties in what these artists are doing. We don't, we're not the artists. We're not the ones, you know, feeling the pulse of society. They feel the pulse. We just give it a kind of um, a home. So a lot of your writings kind of follow the journey of the artist, right? Like you either pick an artwork or the journey of one particular artist to expand. And I think that that probably keeps you uh, as connected as anything else because you're not just listening. You're going deeper. You're thinking through it. And I know you've written a lot about the idea of hybridity uh, and I think it's equally relevant to the African continent as to many other countries you know outside of the west is this idea of when you have been colonized you think 
without thinking across time, across space, across culture. And that's not just about what is the practice? Is it just, you know, photography or painting or drawing? It is how do you see the world? And I know that we're coming to this a little bit in terms of what you're looking to the future, but equally, I'm wondering if you had any issues with that, particularly with your Western audiences or critics, the sense of just not being able to understand this idea of the other. Has that come up at all? It may be possible that it's not, but I find that what feels very inherent to people from you know places which have been colonized or equally places where cultures have just kind of evolved and uh, overlapped over you know whatever the millennia there's a different way of identifying oneself and then equally that translates into artistic practice in different ways i think you know you're touching on another really interesting point if you look at the contemporary art scene today in relation to Africa and its diaspora, I mean, on Instagram, on any social platform, social media platform, you will observe that the dominant narrative and the, the images that relate to the uh, port is portraiture. It's usually, and it's almost like an exaggerated form of blackness. You know, you see all of the work of Kerry James Marshall, and it's like this Kerry James Marshall effect. I mean, there's so many artists who paint in this very um, representative way, figuration, but it's not. It's more like portraiture and identity, and it's kind of expressive art. And you know, the heck, um, Barclay Hendrix, Kerry James Marshall, and the whole, there's a the whole community of young artists painting and representing identity in this way. And you know, identity is a set of narratives that we've told ourselves about ourselves, but it's not always true. It's not always. You, it's not always accurate. It's what you've assumed to be your identity. And if you're the post-colonial, and if we're in the post-colonial, we receive so much external influence, and we're all hybrid. We're all, you know, imbibing different cultures. But the the, the problem is that we uh, there's a tendency towards monoculture. It's like the world is only interested in this monocultural identity that celebrates, you know, this is what an educated, a successful person should look and sound like. And we have to push back against monoculture because the diversity of humanity is what makes humanity brilliant and beautiful and, and um, interesting. So going back to the idea of this representation of this figurative form of blackness that is now all the rage it's actually a very deliberate um statement that these artists are making to say look we don't need to make work that uh, with a lot of strong social background or strong social commentary we can make work that just simply represents our sense of presence in space and time and that's such a radical radical notion of blackness and art that hasn't been given a lot of weight. I, as a countercultural force, it feels more important than ever. I saw an article yesterday, I think it was CNN, showing the Democratic presidential candidate, and then underneath it, the images of three or four black women as his possible vice presidents. And uh, just cannot believe sometimes that in at this moment in time that we can be so reductive in even defining like how somebody should seem like you know and again the power of the image and photography the picture of the photograph of a white man who is already incredibly powerful and then who does he choose and uh you know reducing these four incredible women to yeah. an image it, i mean we could go on and like talk about that in a, a completely separate conversation but equally you know, this, the complexity and the nuance of what you've described and what you've been working on for now, you know, the last decade and, and more. And then this, we're still at this point where the image uh, can be used to reduce and we can use it to reduce ourselves and equally others use it to, to make us smaller. But I also wonder if you feel because of social media, you know, and I'm sure this conversation, you know, again, I'm sure people have asked you this question so many times, 
the power of the image to shock, to move, the power of words we know has you know, diminished entirely because of social media, but equally because of the news and how we converse and um, this short-termist world that we live in. So how have you confronted that is to keep the image, the photograph meaningful through the work that you're doing? Because I personally, I have a hard time imagining how an image matters at all because I can take a thousand pictures on uh, my Instagram and put them up and people will, you know, of course, some of them, they may, may genuinely be reacting to, but equally, they're going to forget everything, you know, within the next 25 seconds as they move on to the next shot. The image is a great question. Just give me a second to move my clock before it goes off. Well, the clock that goes off every... Um, I should say, actually, while Azu is 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 ch fixing his clock, is that he also, uh, you know, he's he has amazing contemporary art behind him, which I would love to know about. Maybe you can tell us. Uh, but also uh, was the director of the Zeitz Mocha uh, in Cape Town. So yeah, the image. It's a great question because I think we, you know, we are at in an age where um, the average person today, living today, has seen more at least the estimates are maybe 15 times more images than people who lived the century before us, um, the generation before us or the century before. So if you think about the production of images today and the, let's even call it the overproduction of images today and what that means in contemporary society, or what that means to visual culture, it's, it's easy to think of it as problematic and um, less significant than in the past, but actually I'd like to think of it as evolving a new visual language. And if you talk to um, young teens or adolescents, you know, and people between say the 15 and 20, they have a totally different idea of images today. They have a completely different visual understanding the way they read images is so much quicker than a lot of people who are experts in the field and have been in this industry for many, many years. They have such a, an understanding of visual culture and they quickly make associations that are not, were not so obvious to, you know, to, because photography is actually a language and language is actually the father of thought. And if you think about it from that perspective where you think about the medium as the message and you think about it from a, that sort of the cultural tilt and the, and the visual, the, 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 the tone of learning. We're at a very fragile period right now where the visual language is actually the most important language and an association of images in sequence has such an incredible power to translate and communicate. So. If you talk about an image of um, Joe Biden and then four African-American women underneath him as, and then he's on top and there are four VP, it's, it's very meaningful. It says much more than um, is obvious because if it was the reverse and to have an African-American woman who was president and probably looking for vice president, they probably put the guys on the same line, you know, because they wouldn't think to put, and this is, these are the things that happen in the subconscious, but we begin to pay attention to it and we become more visually literate and we become, we create a community that actually engages with, you know, this visual language. If you think about the history of Life magazine, over a 30-year period, they had maybe four African or four black people, I should say, on the cover, over 2,200 wow. covers. And Alfred Dajar made a great, great um, work about, about it called Searching for African Life. Uh, they had Muhammad Ali on two covers. And um, other than that, they had a one tribal image of a, you know, the sort of image of a tribal African with a spear and that sort of thing. But the motto and the mission of, of Life magazine was, we bring the world to your doorstep. And mm -hmm. how to bring the world when the largest continent with the biggest people are not represented in this image is like, you know, 
So the, the language matters, and visual language and visual literacy matters. And the more we look, the better we understand. And the almost we, we need fewer words because we can read so much more through images. Yeah, okay, sorry. So then I'll just say this again, is how do you fight the homogenization then? Like, what are the tools? Like, how have you found that to be something that feels addressable? Because like you also already laid out the problems, right? It's like the, the portraiture, how do you go beyond that and still keep it engaging for this public that we still need to connect with? Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's not just up to one person, it's up to the curator, that it's up to um, education is the key. And I think what, you know, what we've spoken about several times, you and I, is creating a lot more people that push back against I want to say, I think of decolonization as like hand sanitization. It's not something that you've done. Oh, I'm a decolonized thinker. No, it's, you've been immersed in it. It's part of, part of your fabric, but you have to continue to, you know, wash your hands, sanitize yourself, completely push back against received knowledge because it's not all bad, but it's not all good. So you have to also have the, the, your wits about you. And so that's when we come to education creating a movement of visual thinkers, um, sharing the knowledge and the experience that we've garnered from you know, uh, various identities and travels and experiences, and also refuse and resist um, acquired identity where people try and tell you who you are. Oh, you're from Lagos, so death for this, or you're from Islamabad, so death for this. People don't actually know your story. We are all, the beauty of celebrating as I talked about this, black portraiture is that it's more about the individual. It's less about the association. You have to now deal with each one on its own merit. There is no real narrative arc where, you know, I need to tell you the story of how this work it was inspired by some war or famine or this work is about migration or the body of, you know, all of these sort of agenda didactism. A lot of the, the work that these guys are interested in and the work that I'm interested in promoting now is anathema to didactism. But that can only happen when you've empowered the individuals to have the agency of individualism, when they're able to say, I can look after myself. I don't need to, I don't need to worry about the, the pushback. I can push back myself. I'm literate, I'm visually literate, I'm culturally literate and it comes with education. But that's not something that happens accidentally. That is something that we have to be deliberate about and intentional about. Yeah, equally having people to pull you up, and I think we've talked about this too, is somebody to look to that maybe looks like you, that could pull you up higher. And that's something that I think you know is across the world, of course, but equally it's as much one region versus another. Um, okay, so to uh, come now to the present moment and really what I know you're working on and I love to hear because I know you're going to be leveraging the African Artists Foundation, the Lagos Photo Festival, the community, public talks, lectures to think about the idea of repatriation and restitution. And for me as a design project, the fact that you're using all of these entities to drive into a new kind of movement Pan Africa. I know it's something that you haven't done before. I know it's partly inspired by this moment in time. I'd love to hear about this particular project, where you're at, and what your plans are, uh, because I know it's going to be very different from what you've been doing in the past. Yeah, great. Just, um, I think the dominant conversation pre-COVID, before the lockdown and before the situation in the museology, especially in relation to Africa and to colonized previously colonized nations and people was the conversation around restitution and repatriation of objects that are sequestered in Western museums and, um, you know, to use that word, Western museums, and not return to, you know, the, to their source communities, another complicated word um, to phrase. But, um, and so my interest really is to accelerate or to catalyze restitution. But I'm not overly concerned about the, um, the high level networking because I do not operate in that situation. That's what the governments to do, where it's about, you know, cultural diplomacy, where um, 
ministers and leaders are talking to each other about it for years and years and years interminably. What I'm interested in doing is a more democratic approach where the individual, your home becomes a museum, where the, your idea of your identity, your cosmology is reduced to what you have in your space and you take and you care for it. And when you begin to care for that, for the history that is embodied in your immediate close community, in your home, then it branches to your community. When you care about your community, then you care about your history. When you care about your history, you care about the objects that are sequestered out there. Because um, before I got involved in this um, project, I actually went out and did a lot of research and spoke to a lot of people. I didn't want to think or make too many assumptions about the importance of restitution because I know that my position might be privileged or not or and can you say what was the goal of this project when you started out or where you are at right now the broad goal like defining the idea of what is restitution for yourself and for the organization i think it's important that we can share our history and our heritage and people feel a sense of pride in where you're from because if you if you don't have a sense of your history, then it's easy for you to feel inferior, go through life feeling like you're less than. You know, everywhere you go, you read about all the great cultures and other great histories, but you don't even have an idea of the greatness that is embodied in your heritage. And the, your history is embodied through objects that were made. And I think what we're doing right now, everything we're doing right now, we're creating future archeological objects. You know, mm. if people were to come, a hundred years from now, 200 years from now, they're going to say, how did people in 2020 live, in 2025 live? What are the objects? What are the the, the deep, what can they find in the ground that we've left behind to give an idea of how we lived? So those things are the forebearers, our forefathers, our ancestors left for us to get a sense of identity, to get a sense of how they lived and how they existed. It's all sequestered and we don't have that sense of pride. We don't have that sense of awareness. We don't have the sense of um, of joy that comes with the owning the, this heritage. So through the home museum idea, through photographing your own cultural heirlooms, think that your grandmom or your, your are you there? Yeah. I lost for a second. The thing that you, your mother, your father, your grandparents left in the home, the thing that you've acquired, it might be a pair of reading glasses, it might be, you know, a, a teapot or something. Building your cosmology at home, your heritage at home, caring for it, paying attention to it, the home, the most democratic and the safest space of our homes. So photographing these objects, and building this online home museum that everyone can participate in and take a sense of pride in what we have still available, I think we can build an awareness for the bigger con concept of restitution, the bigger conversation around restitution, the more famous, the more iconic objects. Because in, on, in Africa, everyone made these objects. They were made for what you might call spiritual elevation, they were made for play, they were made for survival, but they've been reduced to objects that were made as um, for spiritual elevation or worship. But actually, the Afrobeers made toys. They made playthings. They made um, objects that were just to, for education. It's all gone. They made things that were designed to for technology, low-tech objects that were that can for fishing, you know. But it's all gone because we are not able to translate that technology in contemporary time because it's sequestered elsewhere. And we and when you you know you still have stolen the heritage of a people, it's hard for them to feel connected to their true um, history. And so this is the mission, and this is what we're focused on. This is what we're hoping to achieve through restitution. I'm not overly concerned about the high, the 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 demonstrative or the performative. I'm more interested in using this conversation to empower and to, dem and to show that it is possible to build a consciousness, democratic consciousness across social class, across 
the board for for Pan Africa again, and not just Pan Africa, the world. So I I love also you defined it in your in the original kind of plan you had for this is shifting from a monopoly of control to a radical practice for sharing. And I think it's so true. I mean, we get caught in these cycles in our day to day lives in our own countries and relationships of sort of being stuck within the confines of a system. And it's very rare to have people come in to break the actual room that we're sitting in to break down the walls and to say, why don't you step outside? And you, you wrote, um, that right now, you know, there is a sense of, you know, the African continent waiting around, like, please give our stuff back, like you said, speaking at the highest levels. Uh, but why not just stimulate that own process and take back and own your own culture? But I am curious about this is like, you know, so you're obviously involved in some of those conversations. And how do you see this building out? You're building this online. So that's going to be for October, November this year. Is it still that timeline? And so what was the call to action? What has the response been like? And then where do you want to take it from there? So we've got a lot of incredible feedback response from China, from 78-year-old people, from super young 14-year-old kids. We've got a very, very, very broad demographic interest in, in the whole museum idea. And it's, it's actually it's been incredible. And of course, we plan to continue with this project beyond the festival, because for us, it's what you guys and tech call user generated content. So we plan to give um, everyone an opportunity to have their heritage and their history available online. And we and people often ask us things like, well, what if people tell stories or fictional stories around their objects? I said, we like that too. You know, a lot of what we've received about Africa over the last 2,000, 5,000 years, it's all fake news. And we've swallowed the hook, line, and sinker. We need to, you know, forget the didactic narrative, the narrative that we've inherited. We need to start thinking about future, nonsensical even, embrace all the narratives. So we're not trying to sanitize it. We're not trying to create an, ethno, an ethnos or an ethnographic approach to um, the the presentation of these objects. We, we, we're, we're, we're workshopping radical ways to make it super interesting and super demographic so that these objects are not just celebrated, but they're also instructive. They also, we're also able to learn from them. Um, we've got like people from Norway, from Mozambique, you know, like when you, when you think about the history of infrastructure in Africa, there have been so many people who've been here in the 20s and the 40s and, and they've left and they left with objects and they're happy to share they have happy to present them it might be a pen it might be a newspaper article and we just love the idea of engaging the various narratives and telling the history through objects online available democratic free accessible i think it's wonderful i'm really interested in the idea of um how people arrange their space also so there's the object and then there's like how is your house arranged what what goes where do you have a shrine do you have this this sense of again like the house that we know of is so is sort of defined by these these images that we've seen throughout our lives but how can you really bring that back to people saying this is this is the way my, we eat on the floor or whatever, whatever it is, and, and opening that up uh, to new audiences because I don't think we know enough of it. And equally, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about exactly this is like, how do people in various uh, cultures or countries, you know, experience their day-to-day -day lives? And it, it does feel really democratizing. So I'm really excited to see where that goes. So what is the timeline for this coming? The festival is still in October, right? October, still late October. We, and is it uh, going to be online? Online and in public spaces as well. So we plan to have exhibitions in our traditional public space venues, outdoors. We're going to have visual messenger boards where people can, we're going to paste images and people can paste their images on the same spot. We're going to make it completely open. And, and um, in the corona situation, we know that the outdoor space is much safer and 
we can socially distance in public spaces. So we don't, we will not be having a big gathering, but we, we plan to have the exhibition out also in public spaces outdoors. Um, I think uh, the online version would embrace the widest possible demographic where there's absolutely no limit to who can participate. We also organize the workshops, seminars, presentations, artist talks. Um, during the festival, during that period, we hope that the, we can, you know, get a bit of the traffic of people who are interested in the conversation that we're going to be generating around the topic of restitution, the home museum, the future museology for Africa, because I think the world is ready for a new, a new character, a new identity, if you like. I think the iconic superstar architect designed structure for museology is have been good i'm not you know knocking it but i don't think it's for the future we need a sustainable we need a different notion we don't need another monument to the architect's vanity or another monument to our ability to you know be different we need humble situations that allow the lowest possibility in, in our community to be able to engage and to be part of our common humanity. You know, these museums, the way they function today are incredibly intimidating. You know, you know, you walk into the museum and you feel unwelcome if you're not over, if you're not empowered. And so we don't want that. We want to, but we still understand the importance of prestige, but prestige is not only represented in that sort of architecture that dominates. So I'm thinking also that the the ideas that we generate through the home museum, through Lagos Photos Home Museum, the Rapid Response Restitution, could give us notions of future museology that invites everyone and makes everyone feel safe, that you can actually sit in. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't intimidate you to the extent where you feel like you need to be whispering. You should be able to sit, you should be able to think, you should be able to have a meal somewhere, you should be able to engage with the work. The museum for the future is not have not been realized anywhere. Maybe it will happen here again on the continent in Africa. Oh my God, I love that. I hope so. Like this would be the best possible outcome. And it sounds like you're already there. I also was thinking of something that we were discussing earlier is the sense of being burdened when you uh, come from, you know, countries that have been colonized or from a minority with being always serious and trying to fix things and do the right thing and not being empowered to say let's create the new museum for the future let's not try and fit ourselves uh within the mold of what is expected of us or what's been gifted to us but to say this is our museum we might that's our word for it we choose to call it a museum and come and enjoy it or not and without it having to be loaded uh with kind of comparisons which i think is what we're always sitting with and i i i just i love this and it feels like it's happening now i think this is the moment this is the moment where humanity is able to, we can actually feel each other's, that a kind of compassion that is, that a feeling of compassion that is spreading around because we are all humbled by the same situation. We're all, um, we've all been sort of attenuated, subdued by the, by the viral pandemic. So it allows us to feel a bit more connected. Of course, it's a big fallacy when you hear statements like we're all in this together it's a great um equalizer it's none of those we know this we know that if you're privileged you have more options regardless but um it is still the closest thing we have to it we still haven't had a situation that has created such a, a democratization of experience and through this we're hoping that we can catalyze imagine um, and one of the things that i actually love the most is that for the last 10 20 years i'd say um, the dominant narrative in contemporary visual art, especially in relation to not just Africa, has been futures or Afrofuturism specifically in relation to African diaspora. Everywhere you've gone, you've seen Okwen Weather's Venice Biennale in 2015, um, All the World's Futures, um, the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, The Shadows Took Shape. Last year, I curated a show at Zach Smoker. Um, 
still here tomorrow to high five you yesterday. It was all about these various scenarios, these various utopias and dystopias, because we kept on imagining the current COVID situation where we have a dystopia that creates the opportunity for a new utopia. So I think we've been ready for this situation. Artists have been ready for this disruption. And I think we're best primed to take advantage of it. We've been talking about it, debating it, imagining it, you know, designing it, using video games, using music, you know, to sort of come up with this scenario. And now that it's, it's here, I think, you know, we have to grasp it with both hands. Oh my God, that's very inspiring. And so I like, I actually want to keep going, but I need to end it because I said that I would make this short. And so I would say then to that, and like, I'm very motivated by somebody saying something like video game and like imagining using the online space to come back to designing a new kind of future. But to your point, we're already in that dystopian space. We don't really need a video game right now. In a way, we've give, been given this expansive world that of course is gonna go back in many ways to what it was six months ago, ago but in other ways is almost open to being shaped. Um, and like you said, is the artists who probably feel more important than ever in my lifetime in terms of being able to set a vision and, and, and drive us towards it. And equally, the rest of us who, for better or for worse, are empowered to be part of this conversation now. So what I wanted to end with is this question for you of, you know, once we bring together a group of you to start to think about what is the future, and as we build this manifesto of design, what is it that you feel is, you know, and you've touched upon a lot of these things, what is not done yet? What is the one thing that you would like to work on if you had resources, time, space? It could be a continuation of some of these projects that you've mentioned. It could be something completely new that's come up. I'd love to hear from you. Where is it that you'd love to now spend your time on if you, if you could? I think um, I've always said though that design and the image at the pillars of contemporary visual culture. And um, if I could and I had, um, I had the opportunity and the resources, I'd love to imagine a scenario where I articulated the situation for the, the museum of the future for Africa, where I'm able to either workshop, or get a bunch of architects from the continent to come up with ideas for how do we create the museum for the future where we're able to marry education because you know a museum and a university these are civic institutions that create opportunities for learning but you don't go to into university if you don't have the qualifications but you walk into a museum and it's free you get an education you get a sense of your culture and if you can go through life going to a museum every weekend and you'd be better educated than many people who have degrees and never been and never been so i'm interested in the civic demonstration of museology where in africa our forebears our ancestors uh our people before us had art as a means to educate, to instruct, to share knowledge. I'd love to see how we can design the museum for the future and how we can, even if I did not achieve the building, but if we're able to create a manifesto, we are, I was able to workshop, create a situation where local thinkers and designers were able to engage with ecologists and um, cultural practitioners, agronomists, you know, we talk about monoculture. Monoculture it also extends to agronomy, to mm -hmm. the colonial structures have operated historically in Africa where they come in, they plant one produce in one in one forest, in one situation, exploit it. Once it's done, they move to the next. But we can have a hybrid. How do we create multicultural situations? How do we create situations that allow us to be educated to bring different people together to make Africa again the host for multiple ideas. That will be the ultimate thing for me to do. That's something I hope that I'm able to work on at some point. 
I love that. And so I don't want to like make this about like my thoughts on it, but actually to your point, like it does it have to be within a building? It can equally be coming back to the world. We yeah. live in these cities that are going to be swelling and expanding, but equally at risk for being flooded with rising sea levels. And how do we educate the future generations about our planet? Uh, you know, you know, I, just coming back to nature and the outdoors and exposing them in the way that your career has allowed you to expose yourself to people who come from across boundaries and that's helped you grow. And so it, it just feels as though bringing a diverse group of people together to help you to think through this will only help it to expand because I think there's many ways of questioning and challenging even the norms that we have right now prescribed. That is great. That's exactly what I'd love to do. It sounds, it sounds really easy, but I can tell you that it's not. It's really something that we have because actors depend on designers and thinkers. Everyone wants the, tan the tangible. We want to know when it's going to be done. But even if we're able to create that manifesto and leave it as an archive for the future and say, this is what we, we've come up with, we've thought about it, we've thought, thought about Anthropocene, we've thought about the changes in there. We're living through incredible change. In, it's not normal that you experience so much change in a lifetime. It's never happened before. In one lifetime to experience all of this transitioning, it's incredible. So I think it really is demanding of us. Each generation must fight, find, find and discover its own reason for its existence that we, we have ours, we, our hands are full. Wow. Okay, Azu, also a very dear friend of mine. Thank you so much for this. And um, yeah. I really look forward to following up with you on this and your ideas. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you.